Wellesley Weston Lifetime Learning offers non-credit courses to seniors in the greater Boston area. For more information about WWLL and links to our videos, please go to www.llcourses.org. Good morning, everybody. We're very lucky to have James uh, Jamie Eldridge, who's a state senator from the Middlesex and Worcester District. He's an Acton native who graduated from Acton Boxborough High School, went on to John Hopkins University where he majored in political science, and completed a law degree at Boston College. And throughout these years, he was actively involved in community service. He was elected student body president and began his early career working on a clean election bill. And clean election bill doesn't mean, <laughs> well, you can tell us about the clean election. <laughs> when I first read it, I, I was relating to the climate, but it has nothing to do with that. OK. Um, OK. Bill. Uh, the clean election bill which provided public financing to political candidates. As a recent law school graduate, he received a two-year National Justice Fellowship that allows recent law graduates to create their dream political entrance project to help the less fortunate. He shows his commitment and knowledge ever since he was in high school. And when I was reading through his biography last night, He's done so much as state senator, but I thought it was really important that there was a thread in his life from the time he was in high school to commitment to the community, and that was the reason I wanted to focus on this. He did all this before he was elected as state representative in 2002, and he went on to uh, assume the Massachusetts Senate, Senate in 2009 and has been reelected ever since. We asked Senator Eldridge to speak today about criminal justice reform because of his depth of knowledge and commitment. According to Senator Eldridge, we are looking at the biggest criminal justice reform in at least three decades. Lawmakers and advocates involved in the 2018 criminal justice overhaul agreed that their work was not over. And I'm turning this over to him so now he can tell you about it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ann. <clears throat> thank you so much, Ann. And I want to thank you and the program here uh, for inviting me to, to speak about criminal justice reform, although I'm, I'm happy to answer other questions. And thanks, everybody, for coming this morning. Hope everyone had a nice weekend. I, um, as, as Ann had mentioned, I, I serve as the state center for what's called the Middlesex and Worcester District, which is 14 communities sort of west of, of the Sudbury area. So I rep I'm from Acton, but I represent out to Shirley, and I represent down to Marlboro, Westboro, Northboro, Southboro area. So I represent 14 communities. And um, I've been a legislator now for, for, this is my 17th year as a legislator. And as, as Ann had mentioned, the legislature last session had passed a major criminal justice reform package. And I know um, a lot of advocates, a lot of faith groups um, did an incredible amount of organizing really over the past five years to, to basically move Massachusetts away from a mass incarceration model. Uh, Massachusetts, compared to most other states, has a, a lower uh, per capita amount of, of, of prisoners, but we still have a lot more prisoners than we did 30 years ago. And there's, there's a lot of reasons for that, everything from you know, the war on drugs to over-prosecution uh, to sort of how society has changed. But I think there's a recognition that we're really at a point where um, it's not only an a, bur a burden on, on us as taxpayers, but it, it really um, is ruining a lot of lives. And you see this especially around the areas of addiction, is someone that, because they're you know, addicted to opioids or other substances, 
Um, they're getting caught up in the criminal justice reform system, and instead of getting treatment, um, they're getting put in prison where pretty much uh, treatment programs are either not very good or they don't exist at all. But just to sort of go back, because how did, you know, how did someone uh, growing up in Acton and in sort of, you know, a mostly suburban district get interested in criminal justice reform? And, you know, I would say, first of all, some of my earliest memories, and anyone that, that drives on Route 2 will, will recognize this, is you, you drive through Concord, and you've got the Route 2 Rotary, and right there is a state prison. And so it, it's an interesting sort of juxtaposition that Concord, you know, similar to Wellesley, you know, a, a very well-off town, but here you have this state prison that actually houses among the mo most serious uh, criminals in Massachusetts. And um, that got me thinking a little bit, you know, growing up, um, just thinking about that. And then when I was elected a state representative, the district goes out to Shirley, and Shirley has two prisons. So it has MCI Shirley, which is a medium, uh, uh, medium uh, severity prison, and then it has Sousa Baranowski, which is a maximum security prison um, for people that, you know, basically are never going to get released from, from, from jail. And one of the sort of interesting facts is that when you're a legislator, you know, in terms of who are your constituents, it's just based on the population, right? And so I represent around 170,000. And because there are two prisons in my district, you know, not only do I represent those prisoners, but actually um, it's, a, it's a relatively sizable percentage of my constituents, therefore, are prisoners because the prisoners there are counted towards my district. Now, the people who are in prison, because of a, a referendum that passed in the early 2000s, they cannot vote while they're in prison, which is, which is something that's now getting discussed about whether people in prison should be able to vote. But they are counted as my constituents, but they can't vote. So what I started doing when I was elected a state representative is I started going out and, and touring the prisons. And one of the interesting laws we have in Massachusetts is that a legislator has a right to visit a prison at any hour or time of the day. So we're, we're allowed to do a surprise visit to any prison in Massachusetts, really to create more accountability for our state prison system. Um, unfortunately, um, in my opinion, the Department of Corrections doesn't have a lot of accountability. And what's really happened is that the culture there has moved away from a rehabilitation model to really just you know, housing people um, for their crimes, but, but not doing a lot to rehabilitate them. So when I, when I tour MCI Shirley, when I tour Sousa Baranowski, you know, I, I'm seeing very limited programs. There, there's very limited drug education programs. There's limited programs to help people learn a trade so that when they do get out of prison, they, they have a, a job to work at. And just so you sort of have a sense of, of in my opinion, why the, the reentry services are, are, are really poor in Massachusetts is that um, in, in Worcester County, and I represent parts of Worcester County, there's a Worcester County jail in West Boylston. And often when the prisoners are released from that jail, they're not given any money. They're not even given transportation back to where they may have grown up or where they have family. They're, they're just let out of the, the jail, and, and a lot of them are just seen walking down the road um, trying to figure out what their next steps are. You know, that's a, a very bad model if we want to avoid um, uh, recid recidivism and, and try to you know, direct that person on a positive path. So because of the system that we have, there was a concerted effort really about five years ago to begin um, launching this push for criminal justice reform. And this is everything from reducing the prison population to moving away from uh, prosecuting people who are addicted to, to drugs and moving them to treatment to how do we deal with students in, in the school sitting, in school setting. You know, if, if someone, if a student, a high school student, a junior high school student is being disruptive at school, should they be arrested by a police officer? Should there be police officers in the schools? Or you know, is there a better you know, is there a better, more positive model um, dealing with the impact on victims? Um, how do you best help a victim who you know whose home may have been robbed, 
whose uh, mailbox might have been smashed, who, you know, if they're a business owner that someone shoplifted from them, is, is the best model, you know, just punishing that person, or actually um, she would begin something which, which is a bill that I helped to pass, restorative justice, where, where actually the, the person who caused the harm and the person who was harmed actually interact and have a conversation um, that actually has been proven to lower re recidivism across the world, and we, and we knew, now have that in Massachusetts. Um, to other, other areas, uh, like um, for, for prisoners who are in solitary confinement, so they're, they're put in a relatively small cell for 23 hours a day, what kind of support should that person get? Is, is just putting someone in solitary confinement, is that on its own in, inhumane, and should we change that? So what really happened about five, six years ago is that faith organizations, uh, progressive organizations, communities of color, they started organizing and making a push for a major criminal justice reform bill. And so that's when I established the, what's now called the Criminal Justice Reform Caucus. And uh, if, if, if you don't know what a caucus is, basically any group of legislators can form a group within the legislature to focus on a particular group. So because I represent Metro West, I am co-chair of the Metro West Legislators Caucus. So that's legislators that are in sort of the 495 area that work on issues related to Metro West. So I, I also created the Criminal Justice Reform Caucus to look at all aspects of the criminal justice reform system and see where we needed to make reforms. And so um, from that came a whole, whole group of bills um, some of them you, you might have heard a little bit more about is there, there um, are laws in the books going back really to the 1980s in Massachusetts called mandatory minimums. And what a mandatory minimum is, is it sort of came out of sort of the, the Ronald Reagan tough on crime uh, era, is that um, instead of allowing a judge to decide how, how many years someone who's been convicted of a crime should serve in, in jail or prison, the idea was we've got to get tough on judges, we've got to get tough on drugs, you know, sort of part of the war on drugs. So we're going we're gonna to pass a mandatory minimum that says that if you're found with a certain amount of drugs on you, whether, whether you're a drug dealer or whether you're just a user, you're going to go to jail for 10, 20, 30 years. And so that's part of the reason why the prison population exploded really since the, the late 70s, early, early 1980s. So, that was a big focus, but all these other issues started coming up as well. So the criminal justice reform package uh, passed in uh, 2018. It was signed by Governor Baker uh, in June of 2018. And you know, now we're at a stage where, where we're seeing the implementation of the law. Um, and that's really important because I think often what the legislature does is that we pass a major bill and then we often don't look back to say, well, what has been the impact? You know, did, are we reducing the prison population? Are we improving re-entry? Are we better serving victims? Um, are we lowering um, the number of people who are dying from the opioid crisis? So we have a lot of work to do, but uh, I was very fortunate this session, uh, we have new committee assignments, and so now I am the Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Judiciary. So now I will be overseeing the committee that, that essentially looks at the criminal justice reform system. And I think a big part of, big theme of this session, it'll be looking at the impact of the criminal justice reform law. Um, do, we, do we miss any areas? Do we need to go back and fix any aspects of the law? Or are there other things that, that we need to look at? Um, just a, a quick example of something that's already popped up this session is that the Department of Corrections has done two things which I think are, are very negative, is that first, they're uh, limiting the number of family members that can visit prisoners. And so what that means is that, you know, someone who's in prison, more often than not uh, a, a male, is not able to see, you know, his wife, his girlfriend, his kids, less able to see, see them because there's a limitation on the number of visitations. So that's gonna cause less social interaction and, and in my opinion, that's going to mean that that prisoner is less likely to be rehabilitated because they're having less interaction with their loved ones. The other thing the Department of Corrections has done is they, ha they are charging a pretty high rate for making phone calls to talk to family members, um, upwards of 
$5 a minute. And so for the relatively little amount of money that a prisoner makes, um, prisoners earn about 50 cents an hour in, in jail. Um, they're having to use all that money just to make maybe a two or three minute call to their loved ones. Again, that's going to cause more isolation that I, I think is going to lead to the person being less rehabilitated. So I, I think the Department of Corrections, uh, the culture is really not focused on rehabilitating the prisoner. It's, it's a very punitive, uh, very punitive approach. And if anyone saw the, the Boston Globe over the weekend, it's, it, it has an impact on the employees as well because there was a story of a female correction officer who was harassed and mistreated by her colleagues um, because she had actually filed a complaint uh, against, against her, her husband who was also once a correction officer and, and the response was not really support from her but she was um, further harassed and bullied in, in the workplace. So there's a lot of things to change in, in the Department of Corrections. But to focus on uh, some aspects of what passed in the criminal justice reform package, um, and certainly some of the pieces were, were uh, controversial, is uh, one program that I, I think Wellesley participates in, and in, in most of the communities in my district, is restorative justice. And what restorative justice is, is this idea that, um, especially for someone who's young, if they smash a mailbox or spray graffiti on a sign or shoplift, should they be going through the court system, getting a court record, not really understanding the harm they caused, and then having it being a barrier to getting a job or going to college? It's a very different model from you know, 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, where, you know, if someone maybe was caught for shoplifting, the police would, you know, take them to their parents and say, this is what your son did, you know, you should punish him. If instead that, that person is going through the court system, they're getting a criminal record that could follow them through their entire life. And so what restorative justice is, is this idea is sort of empowering uh, police chiefs and prosecutors to say, when someone makes a relatively minor mistake in their lives and, and commits a crime, they're, they're diverted uh, to the Concord Police Department, which has a nonprofit called Communities for Restorative Justice. And what that nonprofit does is that it has members of the community, it has the, the victims, if they're willing, uh, willing to be part of the, what's called a restorative justice circle, um, the parents of the young person, and probably a police officer, and they actually have a discussion where, where that young person has to describe why he or she, you know, took that action, and then the victim gets the chance to explain the harm that they caused. You know, so this was the fear that I had because you broke into my house to you know, uh, try to steal my prescription drugs. So the restorative justice model is this idea of taking you know, a number of crimes, mostly sort of minor crimes, and taking them you know, out of the court system and bringing them into restorative justice, sort of a form of diversion, which has been proven in many other countries and many other states to reduce recidivism because the person who, who the, what's called the responsible party, the person who caused the crime, actually begins to understand the harm they caused versus going through a court process where they usually get you know, a $100 fine, they never have to face the people they harmed, and they sort of go on with their lives. So that is a bill that I filed for about eight years and it was part of the criminal justice reform law. And so that, now that's an option for every police department, for every prosecutor in Massachusetts. Right now, it's only done in, in, uh, in, in this area. So it's, it's done sort of the Acton, Concord, Wellesley, Arlington, Lexington area. But now this is a program that other police departments can do, other prosecutors, especially in, in, the, in the western part of the state in central Mass, can use this as, a, as an option. So it's something that I'm hoping can sort of move a whole group of people away from having a criminal record while also you know, having an impact on them understanding the harm they caused uh, to a, a particular member of a, of a community. So I mentioned earlier about the issue about juvenile justice. And so this is another area that there were some reforms in the, in the law and basically, and it's, it, it's sort of a sensitive issue, but basically the, there's a, a lot of discussion around um, 
what should the presence be of police officers in our schools? And this more often happens in urban communities than suburban, but um, you know, there are police officers in a lot of uh, schools across the state. If a, if a child or a student is acting up, um, should the police officer be arresting that student and, and bringing them to court and, and giving them a court record? Or should there be another way that the teacher or the school superintendent of the prison is dealing with that person? And there's been a lot of evidence that um, more often than not, it was students of color that were being arrested and, and were being removed from the schools. So there was sort of a bias going on by, by teachers or superintendents. So one of the changes in the criminal justice reform law said that unless there are specific um, severe actions uh, being committed by a student, that a police officer could not arrest someone just because that student was, was uh, causing, causing problems in the schools. So the idea is to empower the superintendent, the teacher, or the principal to find other ways to deal with a, a, a reckless or irresponsible student and not having the police arrest, arrest, that, uh, arrest that student. So that is now a law that sort of um, limits um, how, a, how a student can, whether a student can be arrested. And that's part of this bigger discussion about you know, the fact that our teachers, our schools are being asked to do so much more than 30, 40, or 50 years ago. And so if we can provide more resources to school districts, you know, can they provide more support to a family that's maybe going through uh, you know, a very challenging time or, or, or going through some sort of uh, crisis and moving away from um, police or law enforcement, you know, dealing with those issues. So it's one that's, that's a little controversial, but, but I think it was a good, a, a good uh, measure of progress because I do think that there is a lot of concern about how, how much of a presence police officers should be in a school. Um, is that creating sort of a chilling, a chilling effect? So I, I mentioned earlier the, the discussion about uh, solitary confinement, and it, and it is true right now, uh, even with the law changes, that um, prisoners are, who, who are found to be unruly or maybe they're a member of a gang, is they're being put into a solitary, uh, solitary cell. So I've, I've, toured, I've toured this unit uh, out in Shirley, so it's a whole wing of the prison and basically prisoners um, don't have any interaction with any other prisoner 23 hours a day. Um, they're in a cell that's about uh, eight feet by five feet, and aside from the meals that they get, um, they don't get any, any uh, interaction at all, even with a, a guard or a correction officer. And the discussion is, and it even goes up to the United Nations, is, is, is putting someone in solitary confinement um, cruel and unusual punishment. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that says that just two or three days being isolated and not being able to interact with any other human being causes, uh, has a mental health impact. You know, people start um, having, um, you know, nightmares. They, they, they start doing things that are unusual. They start sort of breaking down um, internally. And so what the, what the push is uh, on another bill that I filed that, that got passed into the criminal justice reform law, it says, first of all, um, that the prisoner gets at least two hours outside that cell. So are they exercising? Are they getting to walk outside? Are they getting to see other prisoners? Even just having a little bit more time outside of that cell, is that going to reduce the mental health impacts of being in a solitary cell. Um, education and programming. If you're in solitary confinement, obviously you have even more time in your hands. Should you have access to um, education programs so you can get uh, a, uh, a, um, a, uh, a high school degree or even a college degree? Should you be able to, if, you, if you're suffering from addiction, should you have access to drug education uh, programs? Um, should you um, have access to the library or, or computers, even if it's, say, an hour a day? Um, the other piece is that there's a lot of complaints by prisoners that um, they're being put in solitary for the most minor of violations. So they yell at a correction officer. 
um, and the correction officer um, having sort of in many ways unlimited power is punishing that prisoner by putting them in a solitary cell. If there's a group of prisoners that are advocating for better conditions and then the correction officers respond by sending those prisoners into solitary confinement, should there be some check, should there be some review of that? So part of the law basically says that after 30 days, um, there has to be a review by the Department of Corrections about whether that person should remain in solitary confinement. Because it's, it's quite shocking, but in Massachusetts, and it's still the state law, um, a person can be held in solitary confinement for 10 years. So it's the longest amount of time in the country. So that means that we're longer, you know, we have a longer period of time than, you know, quite honestly, more conservative states. And that's something we, we tried to reform, but we weren't successful. But, you know, just think of the impact, again, even of just being in a solitary cell for a week, not to mention 10 years. And the, the, the other problem with that is that there was no process for sort of transitioning that person from solitary to being released out into the public. And so there were literally prisoners who were in solitary for three, four, five years, and then they had served their, they'd served their time, and they were just released in, into the public. So imagine if you had no interaction really with anyone for five years, and then suddenly you're out in the public, you're more likely than not to be antisocial and, and perhaps to go back to you know, recommitting a crime. Um, so, so what we're trying to do is have a transition process where the person interacts with the general prison population and gets sort of acculturated into um, being in that general prison community before they get released into the public and provided with more support. So those are, those are some of the, the changes that happened. And then um, another piece of legislation that I worked on, um, and this is something that it's gotten a lot of headlines, not only in Massachusetts, but uh, across the country, is um, better training for police officers. So there are a lot of stories, especially with, with, the, with video, of you know, someone who is in crisis or someone is getting pulled over by the police and then there's an altercation and you know, sometimes that, that individual is getting shot and killed. So what are we doing to increase police training, especially around addressing bias issues, you know, racial, racial or cultural bias, um, especially about you know, when a police officer answers a, a, a call from a family member and says, my son, or, my son or daughter is having a mental, a mental breakdown and is, you know, holding a knife in the kitchen and I don't know how to help my son. Um, training that police officer that when he or she is going into that house um, to find ways to de-escalate that, that conflict and, and not immediately going um, to his or her weapon. So there's the, the Boston Globe has done a number of stories around this. So the legislation that I filed requires um, all police officers to go through a training of de-escalation and to address um, possible racial and cultural bias, which, which we all have. Uh, and then we provided a, a, a funding stream of about $10 million to provide this training. And this is so critical because again, and I, I often think about it of you know, my constituents who have sons or daughters who have you know, schizophrenia or um, they're bipolar or they have um, you know, kids who have mental health breakdowns and they're, and they're calling the police you know, out, out of panic and you know, making sure that police officer who's responding to that, that incident knows how to de-escalate that interaction and not immediately um, going to sort of escalating it through, through violence or using their weapon. So that was, that was another part of the criminal justice reform law um, to basically make sure that law enforcement, which you know, has to deal with so many, so many challenges and so many issues, you know, has more training to deal, uh, to deal with, that, with that interaction. Um, I mentioned earlier um, the mandatory minimum laws, and, and that is uh, probably the, the biggest reform in the criminal justice reform package is that, you know, again, going back to sort of the 1980s, uh, 1990s, um, because of this concern about the drug epidemic um, and this, this allegation that the judges were, were, were being too lenient on, on um, 
people who are involved in, in drugs is that uh, many legislatures and the federal, federal governments who are Congress pass what are called mandatory minimums. So now if someone had a certain, of, a certain volume or a certain amount of drugs on him or her, even if they were using it for themselves, they were suddenly being um, told that they could be sent to jail for 10 or 20 years. And there's many examples of this in our state prisons as well as our federal prisons of people being uh, placed in jail for 20 or 30 years for, for relatively minor uh, drug trafficking violations. So we repeal the number of those laws um, and basically the focus is, is that a, a judge should be able to you know, better determine what a sentence should be for someone given all the circumstances of, of the person who is responsible for, for, for a, a, a violation or a crime. And I, I sort of came to this issue um, from a constituent of mine. Uh, I used to represent the town of Lunenburg, which is in Worcester County. And there was a, a young woman who um, very tragically, her, her husband passed away. And out of crisis, out of crisis, she started. She became a, a, a drug addict. She started using using drugs, and um, because of that addiction, um, she actually started uh, dating uh, the man who was her her drug dealer. And uh, one day, he asked her to drive his car to this house. So she wasn't involved at all in in selling drugs, although she was she was a user. And she drove, that, she drove that car to this person's house. Um, about a half hour after she arrived at the house, um, the police raided the house, which, which was being used to sell drugs. And because she was there, because she was in the house, she was, ac she was uh, accused, she was indicted as an accomplice of the crime. Her boyfriend had a very good lawyer and um, was able to uh, reach an agreement that he went to jail for three years. Um, her lawyer, who probably wasn't as good, said, they'll never convict you of this, so let's take this to court. You're innocent, you, know, you weren't involved in, in dealing drugs. You, you were you know, using, but you weren't, you weren't dealing drugs. So they went to court, and she was sentenced uh, to 20 years in jail. So she was at MCI Framingham, and um, she was a model prisoner. I used to visit her when she was there. And she served 12 years in jail until the legislature passed a reform that allowed for early release for, for prisoners who, who were model prisoners um, who, were, who were convicted of drug violations. So she, she is now back at home in Lunenburg but she missed raising her kids. She had young kids, so she missed raising her kids. Um, she's trying to get her life back together. You know, she's limited in the job she can get because she is, you know, a convicted felon. And again, she was someone that, yes, yeah, she, was, she was addicted to drugs, but she wasn't, you know, committing any crimes, but because of those mandatory minimum laws, she was sentenced to jail for 20 years. So we've looked to repeal some of those laws to make sure that you know, someone in that circumstance, and actually when she was sentenced to jail for 20 years, the judge said, you know, I, I wish I could give you a lighter sentence, but I can't because this is the law. And so that judge had no, no flexibility, no room, other than sentence, uh, sentence my constituent to jail for 20 years. So that's, that's pretty heartbreaking. Um, and I will say, when I went to visit her at MCI Framingham, and I've seen this at the other state prisons, is that the services are really pretty limited for prisoners. Um, a lot of the, the re-entry, a lot of the education programs were cut in the 1980s. Um, you went from um, Governor Dukakis, who took a lot of uh, political heat for the furlough, furlough program he had and the, the Willie Horton uh, incident that uh, was highlighted when he ran for president. And so when Governor Weld came into, into office, he was a very sort of quote unquote tough on crime governor and he cut a lot of the education programs. And so what you have, and I've really seen this touring some of the prisons in my district, is that you have prisoners who basically have nothing to do. Um, they have very limited programs. So, you know, maybe they have a program to learn how to become a barber. Well, that's, that's fine, but quite honestly, you know, the, the barber industry really isn't uh, robust in Massachusetts, right? It's not, it's not a, a big area of, of, of growth or a way to make a good living. Um, 
you know, there are jobs around carpentry, which I think are good, but they're pretty limited. Um, so, you know, what if there was a program to teach prisoners, you know, how to install solar panels, which is a really growing area? What if they were to learn some, some level of coding, how to code, uh, given the growth of the high-tech industry? Um, what if there was a more robust restaurant training uh, uh, education programs in the prisons um, because the restaurant business is really booming in Massachusetts? The, instead, um, you have very sort of outdated education programs in the state prisons, and so when someone gets out of prison, it's almost like they're being set up to fail again because when they're looking at their opportunities even to make a living, you know, they're, they're more likely than not to go back to their life of crime. So it's really, you know, sort of a circular uh, program that really has nothing to do, as far as I can tell, with rehabilitation. So that was, that was something that was discussed at the, uh, as part of the criminal justice reform package, but because it was, it was a money item to provide more funding, um, this bill didn't have a lot of funding in it, so I think what you're going to hopefully see with the budget coming up, the state budget, is providing more funding for reentry services. So, you know, I mentioned that the, the Worcester County uh, jails, when they're releasing prisoners, they're not being given transportation, they're not given any support, they're just, you know, let out the gates of that jail. You know, should there be a more robust reentry program so that person goes to a halfway house or that person, you know, is given training to get a job that will provide for his or her family? Um, so I think you're, you're going to see a greater support for reentry services. And part of sort of the bigger discussion, and it's called uh, justice reinvestment, is if we're able to close prisons, if we're able to reduce the prison population, that's going to create savings, right? And so that money could be reinvested through these reentry services, provide better support for, you know, perhaps poor communities uh, where people are, are, are often... Um, you know, becoming victims of crime because, because it's harder to make a living there. So, you know, what I sort of picture is MCI Concord, right? If MCI Concord was closed because you, you reduce the number of prisoners, if that was closed, you take the savings from that and you invest it in, in, in programs. Um, right now, that investment is very low, um, but with justice reinvestment, you could, you could put that money back into programs that would allow you know, more, more robust rehabilitation for, for prisoners. Uh, if you've if you ever driven past MCI Concord, you'll see if you're going from, from uh, east to west is that on the, there's, a, there's a, a minimum uh, correction facility on the right where there used to be a whole bunch of cows and a whole bunch of farms. That, that was a program that, that prisoners in that facility were learning how to grow crops they were, they were actually raising cows. Um, that, that's a program that mostly has gone away. So, you know, can we bring back programs like that to better rehabilitate programs to make them less socially isolated when they're, when they're in prison? And that actually improves the, the culture of the prison and leads to less violence within the prisons, which is better not only for prisoners, but for correction officers who, who have a very difficult job to do. So that's, I think, what... What I'm hoping to see in the future is justice reinvestment. Um, I'm hoping to see, you know, jails, prisons closed across Massachusetts. Um, the, the prison population is declining, but it hasn't declined enough to close a prison. And can we provide better support um, to make sure that, that uh, people that, you know, made a mistake in their life, you know, um, have a chance to, to correct it and, and, uh, and, and live, live a more productive life. I think right now, pretty much the prison system is set up for, for people to, to fail, and that doesn't you know, do anything for any of us. The third highest expenditure of the state budget is, is our prisons. It costs about $50,000 to, to house a prisoner, and if the person's in solitary confinement, it costs $100,000. So that means that all of our taxpayer money is, is, you know, there's more money going to house a prisoner than it is to send someone, say, to UMass or to a community college. That seems, that seems like a pretty backwards approach. Um, the, the criminal justice reform package as a whole was uh, 180 pages, so I'm not going to go through all the changes. Those were some of the major changes in the law, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions people have, whether it's about criminal justice reform, um, or any other issue before the legislature. I, I would say as far as what, what it's possible for the legislature to tackle this session, 
Um, I think clearly we need to do something on transportation. Um, you know, I, I drive in uh, most mornings on Route 2 to get to the State House. If I don't leave by 6 a.m., it takes about an hour and a half to two hours for me to get in. I'm trying to take the train more often, but often because of my schedule, I have to drive. So how do we improve public transit? You know, how do we improve the commuter rail system? Um, how do we improve uh, regional transit and, and bus and shuttle systems, especially for the suburbs? Um, how do we address the impact on climate change that you know, everybody driving their cars has? So I'm hoping we can address transportation. On the climate change front, um, there's going to be a real push to pass a robust clean energy bill uh, that invests more in solar energy efficiency, uh, but also might look at something like carbon pricing to reduce, uh, reduce the carbon emissions that we're all uh, emitting through our, our homes, our businesses, or our cars. So I think climate change will be a, a big issue. Um, the healthcare front, which is a very difficult one, but can we reduce healthcare costs? Can we better, uh, can we provide better support for mental health services? You know, so many of the reasons that people are falling into addiction is due to depression because of a mental health crisis. Um, it's really outrageous, the, the lack of mental health support we have here in Massachusetts. It's very, very hard uh, for a constituent of mine to get their son or daughter you know, access to a therapist. Sometimes it takes 30, 40 days to get to see a psychologist or psychiatrist. Um, that's very troubling and I think speaks to the fact that the healthcare system in general is, is pretty broken. So I'm hoping we can we could tackle that as well. Um, there's a, a lot of discussion around election reform, everything from same-day election registration to a newer idea called ranked choice voting, which would change the way that people um, select their, their candidates and, would allow, and I think would encourage more participation in, in politics and running for office, something which is desperately needed, especially at the local level. I'm seeing fewer and fewer people run for selectmen or, or school committee or for, for municipal office. So I'm, I'm hoping those areas we can tackle as well, and I think probably people here already know the, the legislative session, but in, in Massachusetts has a full-time legislature, so we're in session uh, 10 months of the year. Um, so we'll be in session you know, now through December, and then we'll pick back up in January, and we'll go through uh, around August, uh, and, then, and then it'll be an election year. So we have the time, we ha and I think we have the political will to have a robust session, but this is really where constituents weighing in and you know, contacting us about issues that you care a lot about and we should work on uh, really has an impact. So thanks so much for inviting me, and I'm happy now to open up questions, again, whether it's criminal justice reform or if there's other issues as well, and it's a real honor to be here with you. Thank you. Okay, you go. And you stand up. I can stand up. Um, I, like, I like to read about prison reform and so forth. I wondered, yes. I wondered how you viewed privatiz privatization of prisons, you know, where the, the, the focus seems to be filling beds because that's how you make money, or filling cells, so that's how you make money. And uh, I I've, I've know people who, whose fathers would ever have been involved in the privatization, not as owners, but as workers there, and it seems very detrimental. Is it, so you're about privatization? Privatization, yeah. Sure, so yeah, so one good thing in Massachusetts is we don't have private prisons. You're seeing that in, in you know, states like California and Texas. And actually, the, can you guess what the biggest growth of private prisons right now is? Who's being, who's being held? Immigrants, yep. Immigrants, undocumented immigrants and their children. Yep, yep. But, uh, but we don't have private prisons in Massachusetts, so they're all run, they're all government run, yep. So I don't think that's an issue in Massachusetts. I don't think you'll see private prisons here. Yep. You talked about some of the changes with the new criminal justice um, laws. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to know how those are being monitored. It's just because something's mm -hmm. put in as a law doesn't mean that the system is actually monitoring and making sure that people aren't in solitary as long or some mm -hmm. of the other things that you mentioned. So I was wondering what kind of monitoring um, or evaluation is going on? Yeah, that's such a great question. And so one of the real embarrassments of the, the judicial system, uh, and, and it's particularly embarrassing since Massachusetts is arguably one of the most high-tech states in the country, is that there is absolutely no um, 
data sharing uh, with the prisons or, or information about you know, the, the background of, of prisoners in Massachusetts. So the, the, there's been no investment in those data systems. So that means that um, you know, there's not a lot of knowledge about how to you know, better serve uh, prisoners. So what, what, what the criminal justice reform package did do is it, it actually called for the creation of that system and then it created an oversight committee. So that's going to be looking at the implementation of the criminal justice reform package. Um, so that, that committee exists now. I, I personally, as the Senate chair of the Judiciary Committee, also plan to use the committee you know, to do oversight. Um, and just as an example of how ingrained the culture is in the Department of Corrections, which I think is uh, extremely disturbing, is that um, the, the, the solitary confinement law that I, I filed the legislation that passed said that solitary confinement was defined as someone who is in, in prison for, for 23 hours a day. And so what the DOC did by regulation is they said, oh, well, our, our prisoners now are only going to be in their cells for 22 hours a day, and therefore we're not subject to the law the legislature passed, which is particularly outrageous because, in my opinion, it's, it's ignoring the will of the legislature. So that's something that we'll have to look at, and the, the Globe recently did a story on that. But, um, you know, unfortunately, the, the culture of the Department of Corrections is very resistant to, to change. But great, great question. So if, if the goal of the correction system is rehabilitation and returning people to productive lives, uh, I think probably most people here feel that some kind of education, some kind of preparation for the life they're going to return to is, mm -hmm. is vital, not just important, vital, if they're to be productive. Uh, and, and people who are incarcerated don't have a vote, and mm -hmm. you guys are driven by a budget, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and so you're, you're interested in, in, is not necessarily uh, their interest. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 it just doesn't seem like there's a way out with, with the way the, the system is, is designed now or is operating now. Uh, mm -hmm. What's happening? What, yeah, I, 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 I'm sure you feel it because your constituency are, are, mm -hmm. uh, are, are, are the, what's keeping you in office and, and they mm -hmm. can't vote. Absolutely. And, and yeah, so the, and what's uh, a little surprising, although I, I always say Massachusetts is not as progressive as, as some people think, is that in, um, I think it was 1992, is when there was a, a referendum so approved by the voters to say that if someone is in, in, in prison for a felony, that they, that they lose their, their, their ability to vote while in prison. So that wasn't, you know, that wasn't done by the legislature, that was done by the voters. And so there is a bill to, to repeal that, which I, I support, um, because you're absolutely right. You know, um, you know, if someone writes to me from Susan Baranowski prison, and I certainly read the letter, but you're right, that person doesn't have a vote, right? Uh, not until they get out of, out of prison and then, and then their vote is restored. So I think that is a major issue and I, I think that's one of those issues that I think is, is one of the things that the criminal justice reform package didn't address and now there could be more focus on that is, is uh, the disenfranchisement of, of, of prisoners. So that, that could be something that could be a growing movement. Thank I you. had a question about the reentry program. Oh. Um, I have several friends who in their retirement have volunteered to uh, work with teaching skills in the Concord program. That's terrific. Reading yeah. and math. And they're very frustrated by how limited they are because these um, people are, are wanting to pass their high school mm -hmm. Requirements. GD, yep. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I tried to do was to give some of my old textbooks and books, and I Googled it, and I took 
the books to a place, and when I got there, it had been closed. And so I wondered, do you have any suggestions about how to move forward on this one? Is this part of the, the, the Concord Prison Volunteers Group? Mm -hmm. Yep. And I know that um, they just recently celebrated an anniversary, which I was at in Concord. So that's, that's arguably one of the most robust you know, programs that really shows volunteers from all over this area that are, are doing their part to help prisoners. Um, and I think part of it is, is that the Department of Corrections needs to become more open-minded about allowing more people in and, and um, allowing you know, more materials as well as upgrading their, their facilities. Yep. Um, so that, you know, I think, again, a lot of this is getting the Department of Corrections to, to be more forward-thinking and, and allow, you know, people from outside to come in for, you know, instruction and in, in, uh, in volunteering. So Now, what about donating materials? Do you have any suggestions about that? Yeah, that's a great question. That's something that I'll, I, will, I will check to see, you know, if, if, uh, if that's something that, you know, uh, if there was specifics of what the prisoners might need or want to get a, a list of those things. Yep. Yeah, so I can work on that. Great. Other questions? Yeah. What is the extent of cross-fertilization between convicted felons and the military, people leaving the military. Did you say cross-fertilization? In other words, do the programs that you are developing in the judiciary, is there interaction with the military? Mm -hmm. In terms of... Um, the in other words, when they leave the military, um, mm. are there programs to help them um, rejoin society. Mm -hmm. Okay, so people who are, who are coming back from the military? Yes. Well, there's, there's fairly robust services in Massachusetts of, you know, we have an office of veteran affairs and there, there, are, you know, there are programs where they're, you know, providing retraining and then there's still some elements of the GI Bill that still allow, you know, veterans to go get a, a, a free education, although it's, it's really because public higher ed has become so, you know, expensive, it doesn't pay, uh, you know, all the bills like, you know, say World War II, uh, uh, you know, uh, veterans did. So, um, so there, there are some programs, but certainly need to be, you know, more robust. And if you look at, you know, um, downtown Boston, you know, there's a, a shelter for homeless veterans, and it, you know, continues to grow in numbers. So there's a lot of you know, veterans that are, you know, uh, they're getting prescribed opioids or they have PTSD and they're, and they're not able to fully recover. So I think there needs to be more done. Um, also, that's more the federal government, just because obviously being in the military is, you know, a federal obligation. So, but I don't think there's any interaction between prison programs and veterans. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, good. <laughs> Here you go. Yes, um, all these proposals are really multifaceted, and they, mm -hmm. they appear to intermingle with each other and impact each other. It would seem to me this would have to be changes maybe over a 10-year period. Mm -hmm. You said things like perhaps no police should be called to schools, that the school should handle it. At the same time, you also said there's sometimes a 45-day wait for a, a psychologist. Mm -hmm. All these things would have mm -hmm. negative impacts if they're all done together. It should mm -hmm. be done over a, a period of time and it should be assessed before you go on to the next level of implementation, whatever mm -hmm. it is, because it, it doesn't seem like it should belong together. Yeah, I mean, I... I I would say in some ways it argument it, it should happen all at the same time, right? Because that's part of the problem is if you, if you change, you know, one law and then don't address it through maybe support, then, you know, the, the reform's not going to work. But I, I will say that, you know, it took really 30 years to get to the, these reforms because the past 30 years have been sort of a tough on crime approach. 
and I think there's been a conclusion that doesn't work. And the challenge, of course, for politicians is that most politicians want to look tough on crime, right? And, and so that, that's, that's, uh, that has uh, changed the ability for politicians to pass a reform. And that's why I'm proud of the reforms we did. But, but more needs to be done. And I think to, to, to the uh, uh, woman's point on the very front is that there needs to be a lot more data analysis of the impact of these programs. And I'm hoping we can begin that. Very much so. Thank you very much. Yeah, all right. <laughs>